Student Market webinar. Um, we're pleased that you've joined us today. I'm Brenda Harms with Converge Consulting. Um, I want to welcome you to the webinar and uh, thank you for your participation today. For those of you who aren't aware, Converge Consulting is a multi-channel marketing company that really focuses on helping institutions develop their next generation of marketing efforts, whether that relates to um, utilizing research, Google Analytics, inbound marketing, digital and strategic communications, all the types of things that impact engagement, both student recruitment as well as alumni. So thank you for being with us today, and um, we're looking forward to this webinar. Converge obviously works with a wide range of clients, um, and one of the things that as we have um, developed the business and really expanded, we have discovered that we're spending a lot of time working with schools who work with graduate student programs as well as adult student serving programs. So we've really customized this webinar today to hopefully provide some good information and good background to schools who are working with that particular audience. Um, again, I'm Brenda Harms. I'm a Senior Vice President at Converge. Um, have a, an, a background that involves both working in higher education as well as um, quite a bit of consulting work as well. As many of you know, this is a repeat of a webinar that we did about one month ago, and we had over 150 schools who participated in that webinar, so we decided we would offer it up for a second time, and I'm pleased to say we have over 100 schools participating in today's webinar as well. Um, but one of the lessons I learned from the last time we did this webinar was um, that I have a lot of slides to get through in a short period of time. So I'm going to go ahead and dive into the webinar. Um, I know we still have some schools who will be joining us in the next minute or two, but I want to make the best use of everyone's time here. Just as a quick note, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, this webinar will be available under the resources section of our website, convergeconsulting.org. We will also send the webinar out to you um, after it's completed. Give us a day or two. Hopefully that webinar will also include audio as well as all of the slides, so you'll have access to that. I also want to make you aware, and I'm going to remind you again at the end, that we do have a survey that we'd like for you to complete right at the end of this webinar. It's just a couple of questions, won't take but a minute. There is a section on that survey where there's two blank open spaces. I think the questions are, what did you like the most, what did you like the least? If you have any questions specifically for me that you'd like to have answered, please go ahead and type those into that section and then I can get back with you uh, via email with answers to those questions. We just know we have a lot of content to cover, so we want to be able to keep uh, the webinar moving along. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Thank you again for joining us. Let's talk about adult students and let's talk about higher education attainment. Obviously, this is a big conversation right now going on within the context of our nation. This initial slide that I'm sharing with you right now is a slide I first saw in January of 2008, and it startled me uh, dramatically, actually, to look at the fact that the United States is one of very few countries in the nation that the older population is actually more educated than the younger population. And this particular issue continues to um, show itself within um, our nation, within employment opportunities within our nation, and the overall direction the country is moving. Today we are 12th among 36 developed nations for the percent percentage of post-secondary degree holders, which I think really brings to light this notion of the importance of educating more adult students. But perhaps most importantly on this slide is this idea that we don't have a nation that is well educated enough to do the jobs that we need to have done. So by 2018, uh, Georgetown University has indicated that 63% of all jobs are going to require at least some form of post-secondary education. In almost every other developed nation in the world, obviously the attainment rates are actually increasing for that younger population. We are one of the few where that's not the case. We have fallen from first in the world in relationship to the proportion of adults that have two and four-year college degrees down to four. Um, we, are, we are no longer, by a stretch now, the most educated um, country in the world. And again, we're one of those few nations where the younger population is not as well educated as the older population. Many of you that are participating in this webinar today, just in reviewing the various schools, um, I know I've met you at various conferences, I've spoken with you, I've been to your campuses and visited, and I know many of you are very aware of the Lumina Foundation and what they're calling the big goal that they've established for the United States that really looks at the need to add about 16 million people by 2025 so that we have enough people 
so that 60% of Americans have a high quality degree certificate or credential that's not necessarily a bachelor's degree, but have that education to meet the job demand. 16 million is a pretty hefty number, and so the work that those of us who are on this webinar do in relationship to adult students and graduate students obviously is of critical importance to this. I have a question posed to me actually quite often, you know, is degree completion, is there still a market for degree completion, what's the situation? This is from the 2008 Census Bureau data, so it's a little bit dated as Census Bureau data often is, but what, what we looked at in 2008 was that there were 22% of folks in the United States between 25 and 64 that had some college and had not completed their degree. That's a big, big number when you think about that larger, 37 million people, that larger pool. I would say that the notion of the need for further degree completion programs and continuing to ramp up degree completion programs is absolutely still critical and a very viable um, element of the higher education industry right now. This slide is one of the few slides that's going to talk in my whole presentation about high school graduation rates, but it is so relevant to what's going on with the adult student market because of the fact that for many of our schools, we are going to become more and more reliant on this adult student population. If you look particularly up here in the Northeast, um, there is a real decline in high school graduates. And if you think about where the majority, or at least a big portion, of the colleges and universities are in the North, are out in the Northeast within the United States, those schools, those traditional institutions are really having to dig deep even to recruit that traditional student population. This is a big piece of why the adult student is becoming more and more important in higher education. Now, I do want to draw your attention to some of these regions that obviously are having significant high school graduation rate growth. Um, look, for example, in the state of Texas is always a good example. Look at Florida. Some of these states that have significant number increases are often graduating more high school students who have not historically consumed higher education, and our next slides really touch on that issue. If you take a look at, for example, the Hispanic population and the growth in high school graduation rates between 2009 and what's projected to 22, you really start to see those significant jumps being in population other than those who have historically consumed higher education, which, just to be perfectly direct here, is, is the um, white, non-Hispanic population. To look at this just a little bit more deeply here, in 2008, when you look at degree attainment for that 25 to 64 population, what you really see is that the majority of folks within that age bracket, or, or a vast majority of the folks within that age bracket, obviously are white and Asian population, we see the um, African American population, Hispanic and Native American populations lag dramatically behind. If you think of that high school graduation growth being in some of those particular populations that have not historically consumed higher education, you begin to see the issue that even though there's more high school graduates, they may not all be coming to school quite as readily. So that's another task that our institutions of higher education um, need to tackle across the country. If we look at the NCES projections um, between 2007 and 2018, they are looking at overall growth in relationship to higher education and who those students will be. So if you look at this slide, you see pretty easily that really the Hispanic population is going to grow dramatically as well as the American Indian, um, Alaska Native population is going to grow pretty significantly. If you look at the area where there's the least amount of growth in that white or Caucasian population, for many institutions of higher education, that has been historically the majority of their student population. So with that in mind, we can see that our classrooms, um, whether virtual or face-to-face, -face, are going to change dramatically in the years to come. I want to add to that a layer um, that I, of this slide that I just think is, is very, very interesting and kind of highlights the fact that we as public four-year institutions or public two-year institutions or even private institutions at the two- or four-year level have historically, if you look at the slide, not served some of the minority populations as aggressively or as readily as some of our other competitors in this area, so of the for-profits. So if you take a look at this, what I believe will occur over the course of the next hopefully five to ten years is we will really start to see an increase in a better serving of minority populations within our um, 
public and private institutions across the country. A couple of other notes about income levels. I think this speaks volumes as to what's going on with income levels and how this impacts higher education on a whole. Four out of five 24-year-olds in the upper income quartile have four-year degrees. Four out of five. Good numbers, solid numbers, something we can all be proud of. Only one out of ten in the lowest income quartile hold a four-year college degree. And in slides to come, we're going to talk quite a bit more about the um, financial implications of, of having a four-year degree versus not, and we'll see why this becomes even more important at that point. If we take a comparison, 80% of the top income quintile and only 55% from the lowest income quintile are currently um, enrolling in college directly from high school. So as we think about the students that we will serve as adult students who are perhaps going to work for a couple of years before they come and enroll at our institutions and probably within our programs, we need to be very aware of who our student population is and the background from which they come. We know that low-income students are actually at this point much more likely to attend institutions that have lower graduation rates, and they will also be students who attend part-time. So again, something to be cognizant of as we look at the next um, few years moving forward. We are making some strides in this area, and I think that's something that higher education can be um, conservatively proud of. Right now, nearly half of the adult population is participating in some form of formal education, and that is a trend that's rising. Over 40 million adults, 20% of the total adult population are involved in work-related learning. So that doesn't mean they're all involved in higher education. It means they're involved in various types of learning. But that being said, we still have millions of adults who need instruction that are not participating in instruction. We have many adults who need to retool for the changing job market. And I cannot emphasize that enough. The jobs that are coming in the next years to come, and we are already seeing this as an issue, but the jobs that are coming in the next few years will be jobs that our current adults are just not educated to do. So that need to retool is going to be extremely important. And then realistically, we have about 40 million adults in the U.S. that function at the lowest level of literacy, with only 3 million of those adults currently receiving instruction for that. So obviously really an issue. A couple of notes about today's undergraduate students, and I am just sliding right through these very quickly. I have about 65 slides to get through in the 60 minutes that we have, so I'm going to keep uh, moving right along here. Um, I hope I'm not going too fast for you all. I, I recently had a client tell me that I'm a person who packs a lot into an hour, so um, I guarantee you we're going to pack a lot into this hour today. Um, our current undergraduate student, if you think about this across all the colleges and universities within the country, the over 4,000, is really quite a mix. It is traditional students, but it's also post-traditional learners, adult students, part-time, moms in the classroom, evening and weekend students, branch campus students. I love employees who study. We are a difficult group to define. All of these folks bucket um, to some degree under the adult student model. Even a traditional undergrad often is taking their path to their degree in a very different way than what was uh, thought about for them even 20 years ago. There are a lot of different definitions of the traditional student, which is part of what makes it difficult to exactly understand how many adult students there really are in the world of higher education in the U.S. today. This particular definition, the student who earns a high school diploma, enrolls full-time immediately after finishing high school, is dependent on parent for financial support, and either doesn't work during the school year or only works part-time. That's one definition of a traditional undergraduate student. But again, like I said, there's several. The top set of bubbles here, the green uh, purple bubbles here for you to look at, it was from a 99-2000 stat. And the definition there is the one I showed you on the previous slide. At that point, at that snapshot in time, with that definition that's to the right of it, 27% um, of undergraduates met that definition. With a slightly different definition, in 2008-2009, Peter Stokes put together um, a position paper for the Department of Ed where he said it was actually about 16% of students met what he defined as the traditional model. And that uh, traditional model was that they lived full-time residentially on campus. So uh, graduated from high school, moved immediately on to school, lived residentially was one of his criteria. Either way, no matter whose definition you use, and we're going to look at some others, 
the truth of the matter, the fact of the matter is the non-traditional undergraduate is by far the majority of higher education right now. And, and that's a difficult piece for a lot of institutions to wrap their head around, but this really has become the traditional market. A couple of other things about today's undergraduate population. There are more students that are enrolled part-time and at two-year schools than ever before, 39% part-time, 44% at two-year schools. Women have replaced men as far as the majority in higher ed, and we have more older students on campuses, 39%, 25 and over, it back in, um, are in 1999 versus with only 28% in 1970. So that's a number that's clearly growing. If you spend much time looking at the NCES data, they have tried to define, and this is one of the great debates, and you guys who work with adult student programs know this all the time. We struggle with this at our individual institutions. How do we define these students? And we are anxious to put a definition around the bucket that they sit in. NCES provided some guidelines here, delaying their enrollment into post-secondary education, so took some time off between high school and college, attend only part-time, um, excuse me, attend only part-time, um, are financially independent of their parents, work full-time while they're enrolled, have dependents other than a spouse, are a single parent, or lack a standard high school diploma. These were some criteria that NCES put around what they could define as a non-traditional student. And I think this next slide is what's particularly interesting, even though this is a little bit dated data. So at that time, if you look at this public two-year line, so when we look at public two years, only 10% um, 10.5% of the population didn't fall into any of the non-traditional buckets. 14% were defined as uh, minimally non-traditional, 35% moderately, and 40% highly non-traditional. One of the lines that I'd like to draw our attention to is the private not-for-profit. 50% of the model, in, or 50% of students back in 99, 2000 fell into that traditional bucket, but still a significant portion in that minimally to highly non-traditional. And my guess is if this data with those seven criteria were redone right now, we would continue to see those numbers um, slide. For the public four years, and I know there's a number of you on the phone with us right now, um, you see a lot of students as well who are doing that, that route with you in that non-traditional to a certain degree. Um, criteria, meeting that criteria. A couple of other things that NCES shares. Of undergraduate students currently, 38% that are enrolled are over 25. The share of all students over 25 is projected to increase another 23% by 2019. So add 38 to 23. We're, we're clearly well over 50%. We're into the 60% range of those over age 25. Um, Nearly a quarter of post-secondary students in the U.S., or 3.9 million post-secondary students, are parents. 43% attend community colleges, um, and as much as 60% of all community college attendees are adult students. 30% of undergraduates that are enrolled at public four-year regional universities are over 24. You see the age move a little bit there. And then almost 40% of all undergrads and 60% of those at the two-year publics are enrolled part-time. So that new student is really going to be the definition of part-time. I don't know if any of you subscribe to, I believe it, I saw it this morning on the Lumina Foundation. They have a daily newsletter that comes out. If you're not a subscriber, go to Lumina's website and subscribe to that daily newsletter. It's free. It is a great resource. Tons of great articles. They talk about the issue of adult students within that um, newsletter often. And it's really just a culmination of a lot of different articles. But there was a great article by a college president that talked about the fact that students of the future will attend part-time, period. It's not really a point of conversation hardly anymore. It's that notion that the majority of students will start attending um, college or university on a part-time basis, which I thought was an interesting um, interesting statement for a college president to make. So, And it was a college president outside of the United States, which I thought was interesting. Within the context of this webinar, I put, I slide in a few, put in a few of these slides that just ask you to pose the questions to yourself. I know a, a number of you are not just singly participating in this webinar, but might have a team of folks from your institution there. And I hope um, once this webinar is over, you're able to go back to some of these ask yourself slides and really talk through with your colleagues, and I'm also going to encourage you to push this up to senior management, discussions about how these trends impact what's going on at your institution. So first and foremost, 
Is your institution following national trends? And do you know if you are based on data or based on hunch? Um, I think data collection has become the biggest challenge at most, well, uh, one of the many biggest challenges at many colleges and universities across the country today. We operate a lot on hunch. I can't tell you the number of times I go to a college campus and I say, so how old is your adult student population? Give me the numbers, give me the averages. And they tell me, oh, it's about a 35 to 40 year old um, Caucasian woman. She has kids, she works full time. And then I say, give me your data. And we really crunch the data and the numbers. And what we come back with is, well, yeah, that was your student population 10 years ago. Today, your student population is 31. Um, it is still predominantly women. Some of them have families. Some of them don't. Um, you know, and really beginning to understand what your student population really looks like. I encourage you, if you do have the opportunity to crunch data, and don't become obsessed with this if you don't have any data right now, but if you do have the opportunity to crunch data, crunch data based on academic program, and I can almost guarantee you, you will begin to see trends of the types of students who fit into the different academic programs. It is a great segmentation strategy for marketing. Other things that I would think you need to pose to questions to your own institution in relationship to national trends in higher education is what has our institution done to be responsive to this? Have we added online courses or programs? Have we, we revisited our policy for credit for prior learning? Are we increasing our, our focus on articulation agreements and the relationships we have with community colleges, knowing how many adult students sit in community colleges today? Is there a representative from the non-traditional side of the house that has recently acquired a seat at the big kids' table. Um, I don't know if your family ate like that at holidays, but there was the adults' table and the kids' table. You want to have a seat at the adults' table, and that will mean that your voice is really heard within the context of your institution. Okay, I'm going to keep moving here. We're also going to take a look at labor market demands, and, and I am going to move through this fairly quickly, but I hope it gives you a sense of things you need to be paying attention to as you look at development and tweaking and modifications of your adult student program. The big issue in the news for the last five years has been unemployment and it has been huge and we have felt badly in the recession and blah, blah. One of the things to keep in mind or a piece of this is to recognize that while unemployment rates at one point really rocketed up to around that 10% number, for those folks with a college degree, that number only ever got to 4.5%. I think that is a critical element for marketing and recruitment. I think that is important to communicate to our prospective adult students who are asking the question, is this worth it to me to come back to school at this point in the game? We never know, and this is scary, but we never know when something like what happened in 2008 with the economy might happen again. We need to be prepared for it. We also know that workers with a bachelor's degree typically have annual incomes that are just about 20,000 more than those who have only completed high school. And most importantly is that the economy and the job market is going to continue to leave behind those employees who have not retooled their skills. And, and when I talk about retooling their skills, I'm not necessarily saying a four-year degree is for every person on the planet but some sort of skill development, whether that's at the technical level, whether that's at the community college level, some sort of skill development is, is going to be critical moving forward. We know that our employees are now facing much more of a global marketplace and being trained within the context of that is going to be much more important. One of the things that's very interesting to me is as we've looked at the economic recovery, we know that right now our economic recovery is being slowed by the fact that we don't have workers with the right skills to put in the jobs that are out there and that exist. So it's people who are willing to come back and retool for something they might not be familiar with already. Our ability as a nation to upskill workers is going to be critical. That also means that our ability as institutions of higher education to get outside the box of what we have offered for the last 15 or 20 or 30 years is also going to be critical. And I clearly feel passionately about that point. We have to get outside the box of what we've always offered from an academic program's perspective. So today we need to produce an additional 3 million workers with associate's degrees or higher and 5 million workers with technical certificates and credentials by 2018 just to make us 
economically competitive and economically mobile in our society right now. Employers are demanding that new hires come to the job with hands-on experience already. You can see why exactly this really lends itself nicely to the idea of working part-time or working full-time and going to school part-time. It's almost like now employers are expecting you to gain both experience and education hand-in-hand, -hand, right side by side. They need it. Employers are needing individuals who have both technical knowledge but also practical experience in solving workplace problems. For a lot of our adult students, not all of them, some of what, what employers have historically considered kind of soft skills, some of the interpersonal skills, the teamwork skills, those sorts of things, a lot of our adult students come to our, our institutions with a lot of those skills in place, not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to help with the other side of that. I think I've already pointed out the fact 60% of jobs in the U.S. are going to require post-secondary education by 2018. And then the type of integrated post-secondary education that yields this sort of knowledge and skills, quite honestly, is not common in higher education today. If you think about it, your own institutions, it's you have folks come in, you have them sit in your classrooms, they learn their classroom knowledge, they go back out the door, they go back to their workplace. That integration piece is what's really missing right now. If we look at labor layout, um, a couple of, again, quick points, and I think they're helpful points for recruitment staff as well as marketers. Four out of five jobs that were lost between 2008 and 2010 were held by Americans who did not have more than a high school education. Comparatively, Americans with bachelor's degrees or above actually gained jobs during the recession and have seen an increase in about 2 million jobs during the recovery since 2010. If you have a degree, you are able to make stronger headway. And again, I think that's very important for both recruiters as well as marketers. We also know that most Americans today recognize that as a nation, we need more, more and more people who have that post-secondary credential. And the one that strikes me um, as just ironic, as I'll get out, today our employers are complaining most that they can't find people who have the skills for the jobs that they have open. So that has really become a much more pressing issue. With that in mind, again, ask yourself and challenge your institution. How are you responding to local labor demands? How are you taking a look at what's happening in your region and trying to meet that within the context of higher education? How are we trying to take care of business and assist in this process? The other thing that I want you to keep in mind is that these are opportunities for recruitment staff. These are points for recruitment staff as well as marketers to leverage when they're communicating with prospective students because I understand the resistance that a lot of adults have today with coming back to school. It's a big investment. They're not sure it's going to pay off. They are unemployed right now or maybe barely employed or underemployed. There's a lot of risks. And so really helping them to understand the long-term payoff and the longer-term opportunity um, I think is important. Another point that we need to take into consideration is what the public's opinion of higher education is today. And we all know and we all recognize that we have kind of taken a beating, um, if you will, in the last six months to a year. Um, and higher ed as a whole has really gotten criticized and scrutinized for its business model, and I am using little finger quotes when I say business model, as well as for its, its cost. One of the things we have to be willing to recognize when we think about a post-traditional learner or an adult student or a graduate student who's doing the full-time job and coming back, these are the people that are the wage earners for themselves and their families. They are not in a position to give up, cut back, do less in their employment category in order to fit school in. They are going to be combining work with learning and we have to understand that. They're going to need to be moving between the two. They are going to pursue knowledge, skills, and credentials that their employers are going to recognize as well as compensate. And that's critical. If my boss doesn't think this is critical need, I'm not interested in doing it. I'm not interested in spending my money for it. We also know that they're going to require developmental education to be successful in college level courses in many cases. And they're going to need some academic and career advising to help them navigate what is often going to be a very complex path to their degree. The Lumina Foundation um, did, again, a really nice uh, research study, and this just came out a couple of months ago, that really took a look at public opinion in relationship to higher ed. But one of the things that I, that I am, um, I don't know, uh, assured by, I guess, is what I'm going to say, is that 
in our country, we do still recognize the value of higher ed, even though we see a lot of negative press about it right now and they're asking a lot of questions about it right now. Today, 97% of all Americans say having their degree or certificate beyond high school is at least somewhat important, if not very important, to financial security. We get that those two are linked together. Um, more than two-thirds, about 67%, say getting a good job is a very important reason to get education beyond high school. And just about 65% say earning more money is a very important reason to get education beyond high school. So we get that. We understand that. Of those Americans who do not have a post-secondary degree or certificate right now, the majority agree or strongly agree that they would feel more secure in their jobs as well as in their financial future if they had one. So people know they need it. They, they, they suspect it. It's a nagging thing in the back of their heads. And for those of you who talk to adult students, we hear this all the time. About four in 10 Americans without a post-secondary degree or certificate said they had thought about it in the last 12 months, thought about going back to school in the last 12 months. I know how hard it is to reach that point in time where an adult is thinking about going back to school and boom, your marketing campaign or whatever happens to get in front of them at that moment and they choose you. But the fact of the matter is adults usually think about going back to school for a very long time. So it's about staying in front of them consistently from an awareness perspective. It does lay foundation and groundwork. That same Luminous survey also took a look at what people thought about issues of cost and quality. And this was the one where when I read this article, I kind of held my breath. 76% of those interviewed for this particular survey believe the US education is better or the same as education from other countries. 69% believed it's better or the same as it was before. 76% agree strongly that traditional colleges and universities offer high quality education. 54% agreed strongly that community colleges offer high quality education. And 33% agreed or strongly agreed that online colleges and universities offer high quality education. All that being said, only 26% of those interviewed believed that higher education was affordable for everyone who needs it. We have been beat up over the issue of cost lately and to a certain degree. I almost don't blame people for doing so. When you look at this number, um, it's embarrassing, I, and I, I don't think I'm too strong in saying that that way. The rate of inflation for higher education since 1982 is at 439%. It is higher than medical, and it certainly has gone up much more dramatically than the median family income. I know that that doesn't always relate to your individual adult student programs. I know many adult student programs that are offered at a much more reasonable price point than traditional higher education is. But the long and the short of this is higher ed from a consumer standpoint is put into one bucket, is viewed through one lens, and this is the numbers. These are the numbers. This is what people are looking at. These are the types of things that are, are causing our nation to stop for a minute and say, hey, wait a minute. What is going on over there in the world of higher ed? On that positive note, <laughs> sorry, kind of a downer there. Um, it's, it's certainly something we have to continue to be cognizant of and aware of. When that same Lumina Foundation study also asked people about adults about earning college credit, um, I think this is great. And again, if, if these stats and data do not assist you in revisiting your prior learning assessment and your evaluation of, of prior learning, um, boy, I don't know what will. 87% of those interviewed believe students should be able to earn college credit for knowledge and skills they've learned outside the classroom. 75% would be much more would be more likely to enroll in a program where they could be evaluated and receive credits for what they already know. If you do that and you're not marketing it, oh my goodness, please, please, please get on the marketing. 70% believe that if you have mastered the material being taught in a course within a shortened time frame, you should be able to get your credits and move on. For the sake of this particular research study, they looked at without completing a 16-week course. I know many of you don't utilize 16-week courses. This was just the context in which they did do this survey. But again, the bulk of students, adults, were practical. If I've got it, let me get my credits and let me go on to the next thing. We know that the adult student market is going to be the fastest growing market in higher education. It's a growth rate of more than 20% between 1990 and 2007 in the total number of working adults who are participating in adult education courses. Again, projection here increases it by another 18%. Over 
but these adult students are going to require easier transfer of credit from institution to institution, much more flexible course offerings, certificate and degree programs, much more flexible financial aid policies. And I know that for many of you that's a can of worms that you may or may not have much control over, but certainly a critical element of this. And then lower cost alternatives to attending college. There are some very interesting academic programs right now that are cropping up, some very different models right now that are cropping up. Um, Southern New Hampshire University obviously is one that many of us have heard of and are familiar with. Western Governors University, very familiar with as well. Different sorts of models to help people get the credential, get the degree at a much less expensive price point. Um, and they're doing very well. We know that our adults want easier transfer of credits and policies that support working adults. We also recognize that that flexibility piece is going to come in a lot of different shapes and sizes in the future. Of the folks who identified or who choose not to enroll in school at this point, 22% cite cost as the primary obstacle. Even if you are, in your mind, very inexpensive, uh, a good friend of mine just said to me, I said, um, it's $2,500 per semester and you can earn as many credits as you want. And his response to me was, $2,500, if you don't have it, you don't have it. And that's a lot of money if you don't. And it's a very valid point. We know we need to look at increasing grant aid um, and looking differently at student loan programs and tax credits. And then also some lower cost alternatives, online courses, hybrid courses, those sorts of things. Just a quick touch on online. Obviously, online education is continuing to grow. The rates of growth in online far exceed the face-to-face -face classroom time. Um, more than one in four higher education students today has taken at least one course online. Over 4.6 million students were taking one course, at least one course online during the fall of 2008 term. I'm sure that number is much higher by this point. Compared to 1.2% growth of overall higher education student population, there's a 17% growth in online, and this dates back to 2008. I think this is historically interesting to take a look at. If you move to the center of this particular slide where it says students taking at least one online course and look at where that number has gone between 2002 and 2008. This has become the norm. Um, I just, I was flying Delta last week and just snagged a magazine out of the back of the seat pocket that was once again, and I can't believe we're still having the conversation, I'm actually going to need to write a blog about this. We're still having the conversation, are online classes really as academically sound as face-to-face -face classes? And there's some great new research out um, done by Babson that's really helped um, to take a look at how opinions of that are shifting. But again, look at this growth rate and look at the growth rate in online. Um, very significant. We know that 82% back in fall of 2008, 82% of students who were taking online classes were doing so at the undergraduate level. We also know that even during the economic downturn, there were still increases in online education. So as you can see, if you look to the bottom two, their existing online courses continue to grow, the orange line there, and then the new online courses and programs continue to grow. The new face-to-face -face courses and programs during that economic downturn, you see the change, the slower growth. <coughs> now, the reality of online education is this. Most institutions that want to do this are already. The giant impacts that are going to be had and made and the giant money, let's just be honest, money that's going to be made in online education, quite honestly, to a certain degree, has already been made. Right at the moment, those institutions who are still offering their first online program, who are still getting out into the marketplace with this, I don't think it's an issue anymore of being able to be a big winner. I think it's an issue today of being able to feel the team and being able to stay in the marketplace. It's nearly critical for relevancy in today's world. Moving along. A couple of questions again posed back to your institution once we uh, wrap up from the webinar. What have you considered doing at your institution about the issue of cost? Um, there's an institution in Minneapolis, Minnesota that cut traditional undergraduate um, costs by 33% this year. Now, the flip side, they also cut their gift aid but they've gotten a lot of press because of that bold move. What is your institution going to do in a big way to get costs under control? And folks, I'm just gonna be honest, this is never a popular message, but instead of increasing tuition by six or 7% and cutting that to two or three, 
is not going to make us look better anytime soon in the marketplace. So what's the dramatic thing that your institution is going to be willing to do? Are you willing to package up degree programs for a flat rate? Regardless of how long it takes a student to go through them, they pay this chunk of money and they will get their degree in that no matter how long it takes them. What's the creative idea? If a full 40% of adults who don't currently have a degree have thought about going back to school in the last 12 months, what have we done at our institution to talk to them about that issue? And yes, it's going to be a long, ongoing conversation. What have we done at our institutions about online courses? Do we charge more for online courses? If you do, you need to stop. Um, that's a joke. It's not allowed anymore. Um, when they were first new and fresh, it was allowed. Today, no, definitely not. They're much less expensive to run. Do we offer faculty? Do we offer academically what faculty want to offer online, or do we look at student demand? And then how do we monitor what is being offered online to make sure that we're meeting our quality needs? A couple of quick slides on training um, and uh, business and industry training. And again, I just think these are fascinating. Um, American corporations in 2004, now this goes back quite a few years, but in 2004 spent $51 billion on training. It is a B, it's not a mistake, billion on training. Of that sum, about $13 billion were devoted to purchasing services from third-party providers. That includes professionals and consultants and things, but also colleges and universities. Of that $13 billion, 5% of it went to colleges and universities, $670 million. The reason, the reason behind this slide, $51 billion is being handed out by businesses and higher ed gets $670 million. That's abysmal, that's embarrassing. And the reason for that is we are not responsive to business and industry needs. If it historically hasn't been offered under a four-year degree model that our faculty could you know, dictate what the content was going to be and those sorts of things, we weren't interested in doing it. I had a president of an institution two years ago say to me something about, we aren't going to offer um, a physician's assistant sort of program. It feels too vocational technical and we are, after all, a private prestigious institution. It, we have to stop believing we are in charge in higher education. We have to start recognizing that industry drives us, our consumers drive us. Okay, continuing to move on here, I'm keeping an eye on the time. Universities aren't really designed to be rapid in their response to what industry needs are. And one of the interesting things is in this same piece of research that these numbers came from, it talked about the fact that when businesses seek out third-party providers, what they're typically looking for is highly customized and applied learning sorts of training. When they took a look at the two areas that universities needed to do better on, it was applied learning and customizing training. So what they most need, we really aren't very good at at this point. Now, that being said, for institutions that have begun to align themselves and have really capitalized on this opportunity, there is a, there is a, there is a gold mine sitting here. But you have to be willing to meet employers where they're at. We have to look at aligning our educational offerings with the needs of employers. And quite honestly, if we don't, they're going to continue to go other places to find those skills and those needs. And we, in higher education, will continue to become more and more, uh, this is kind of hard language, but honestly irrelevant to business and industry. We aren't driving them. They are driving us. We have to partner with them more effectively. So take a look at your institution. How are you handling community outreach? How are you handling employer partnerships? How are you handling tuition reimbursement? And don't forget the real question, who has the upper hand in that relationship? It's not us. And when I ask you, how are you handling those three areas, community, employer partnerships, tuition reimbursement, um, how do we show ourselves to our business partners? Do we send the brand new employee who has absolutely no credibility, well, I don't mean no credibility, but no um, Oh, no credentials, so to speak, at the institution, no ability to make any decisions, no ability to actually negotiate any deal. Is that the person that we send out to our business and industries to say hi and drop off our belongings? Or do we send out the provost, the academic dean? Do we send out the VP of enrollment to actually go out and have some of those serious conversations? One of the institutions that I know of that best capitalizes on this, their president is directly involved in every one of those relationships because he views them as so critical. And they don't have more than maybe half a dozen 
really strong partnerships with business and industry, but they are all at senior, senior, senior level management um, levels. And so those relationships with those businesses and industries are not just very, very solid, but they were built on the proper foundation right from the start. A couple of quick slides here on policy response, and I am going to get through these quickly so we have time for the final slides. Um, as, again, as I've touched on several times in this presentation, Lumina obviously is doing their strategic plan 2013 to 2016. At the current rate that we're adding academic degrees and credentials, we are going to fall short of the 2025 goal by about 23 million degrees and credentials awarded. Again, that 62 million number continues to loom out there. And we have to do that or reach that number by expanding access. We have to start thinking beyond high school. And we have to really dig into lower income areas, first generation student areas. We have to look at minority students, immigrants, veterans, adults, some college, no degree, the whole nine yards. It's a comprehensive look. We know that Lumina has put in place a couple of pieces here that will really help all of us. Um, I am personally very interested in a lot of what they're doing at a national level, but I think this next slide perhaps reaches into the area that we might feel impact within higher education. These new models of financial support that are being discussed and talked about for adults um, that will impact adults um, could be could be tremendously beneficial. I think that is extremely important as we move forward in higher ed. But I'm also going to say money is going to be most available for institutions that are willing to be innovative and think outside the box. And so this notion of how do we put together a different model of educating adult students is going to be asked and re-asked over and over and over. Let's spend our closing 10 minutes together really talking about our response in higher education because I think this sort of a webinar I think gives you a great baseline of understanding of, okay, what's going on out there? What are the needs? What's the demand? A lot of this, to some degree, this is always a nice webinar because in many ways I'm preaching to the choir here. You all already know this, but how do we drive a decent response in higher education and more specifically at our institution? We have to keep in mind that the new demand of the post-traditional learner or the adult student or the non-trad or whatever you want to call them is going to be much more modular, easy to access instruction. How these adults consume higher ed is shifted. We have to be willing to blend both academic as well as occupational curriculum together in order to meet these needs. We have to have very progressive credentialing of knowledge and skills, and we have to be willing to do that. No, it does not cheapen your institution. No, it does not lessen the credibility of your institution. No, no adult student thinks if you're willing to package up the fact that they've worked for the last 20 years at a CPA firm and make that into a uh, credential that meets criteria for X, Y, and Z accounting course. No, they won't think less of you. We need to let go of some of that. We know that the new, that the current adult students and the new demand are going to take a look at the financial, the academic, and the career advising as really a three, um, three-pronged three stool, if you will. It's not going to be enough to offer the right program. We are also going to have to be able to offer the correct assistance in relationship to financial advisement as well as career advising and really take care of those the, all three important pieces of the same puzzle. We also know that public policy as well as institutional policy is going to have to continue to change to reflect these complex lives of the people that we're working with. Our current typical, and, and not all, but many, typical college experiences, quite honestly, are still designed around the 18-year-old traditional high school student who just walked across the stage in May and is going to start classes in August, and no faculty are going to be on campus all summer, and those bright, shiny faces will show up and sit in their classrooms in August and think the world of them until December, and then everyone will be gone for four weeks in December. That model still exists at a whole lot of institutions. We used to think, and to some degree still do, that students really need to adjust to institutions. I'm at a university right now that I had a great conversation with a transfer student yesterday who was telling me about the nightmare that they experienced trying to transfer to this institution in January. He had to get a PIN number from his academic advisor who was a faculty member. The faculty member was out of the country for three weeks over the holiday. He never got his PIN number until two days before classes started, and when he got the PIN number and went to register for class, all of the classes he needed were already taken. He's a transfer student. He only needs a limited number of credits. He had to sit out a whole semester. That's that notion of students needing to adjust to us, that we are going to have to start um, dispelling that. 
on our campuses. The traditional learning model, classes, grades, tests, little feedback, and a lot of too little, too late sorts of feedback. We know that in traditional models, prices are high, especially when we start thinking about extra fees and books and things. We know that financial aid at a lot of institutions runs out very quickly. It is a highly intimidating process, and it's often very overcomplicated. We know that failure and withdrawal rates are very high at many traditional institutions, especially in those developmental courses where there needs to be extra help. And we know that institutions of higher ed can sometimes be a bit impersonal and doesn't really offer the one-on-one -on -one coaching or peer support that we need. I think this is a nice graph because it really looks at that idea of the way it used to be to the way it's going to become. And I'm going to focus my time on the right side of this screen. We are going to move to models of higher education that really look much more at individual students at the heart of the learning model. What do you need as an individual, not what do we need to teach you as an institution? We're going to start seeing more low cost as well as free content being put out there. We're already seeing a lot of that. We are going to start looking at small chunk learning and awarding competencies for um, being able to demonstrate, or be, excuse me, awarding credit to being able to demonstrate competencies in certain areas. We're going to start seeing varied times in relationship to the learning model, the mentor or peer-to-peer -peer community learning supported model, and then learning comes to students where they live and work. That notion of needing to come to the institution is pretty obsolete. We also know in the future that students are going to set their own pace. They're going to be heavily online. We know that there are going to be aggressive partnerships being made for alternative credit pathways. Um, learning counts through KL, Straighter Line, Coursera, ACE. If your institution isn't engaged with these right now, I'd start looking into them in a big and aggressive way. Schools who do and can promote this as part of their marketing, we have this relationship with learning counts. We're willing to take X number of credits that KL has you know, deemed or awarded to you. That's going to matter to prospective adult students. We know that they're going to have specific programs aimed at, aimed at adults with complicated lives. We have had this historically where we were willing to be flexible was still pretty inflexible when many of these adult student programs were developed. I think that need for further flexibility is upon us and we are going to start being challenged by our students. We are going to need to start offering much more solid student support services. Um, if you do have residential or on-campus classes, we know that for a lot of adult students, they show up about the time the parking lot clears out. There is absolutely no one around to help them if they need a sandwich, need financial aid things, need to get in the bookstore, need to pay the bursar's office. Again, this is a model we're going to see needing to change and changing. We are going to see a lot more in the competency-based areas, and we are going to see lower cost moving forward. This is just a quick slide of some consideration points. Um, to take a look at when you are considering and evaluating your adult student program. I'm just going to keep moving on. A couple of specific considerations that I'm going to ask you to take a look at in relationship first to your marketing. The strategies that we employed even five years ago today are horribly outdated. I happen to be sitting on a college campus today where we are talking about recruitment and we talked about the fact that they revised their entire communication flow five years ago for recruitment. They really did an overhaul and they felt so good about it and so much of it today is so out of date because things like the heavy use of social media that they are using today just were not really in play when they did this five years ago. So the world is changing. We have to look at our strategies for marketing. We have to be willing to maximize our digital media um, to reach prospective students. We know that adult students spend a whole lot of time on our institutional websites. And depending upon how you feel about your institutional website, I'll tell you most of the ones I've been on um, lose even me. And I spend all my time around higher education. I feel like I know the internal tribal language pretty well. And I am frequently confused. So we have to do a better job with our digital media. We have to put our most relevant foot forward. What do you have to promote and what's relevant to promote to our audiences? Small class size, you've probably got better stuff than that to talk about. We have to know our audience and we have to market to the population we're actually serving or want to be serving more of. You can't do that effectively unless you understand the data. A gut or a hunch is not enough. We have to be willing, this is a bold one, we have to be willing to stop placating faculty, college presidents, as well as academic deans in relationship to what it is we're marketing. And we have to talk about the things that matter to our adult students. Money matters. If you are a lower cost provider in your region, start talking about it. No 
Some folks probably won't be thrilled with it. No one wants to be Kmart. But the truth of the matter is today being a good, solid value for a low cost is money in the bank. We have to get to the point in our marketing. Most of us are very, very guilty of using way too many words in relationship to the marketing efforts that we do put out there. And then most, and you're going to hear this over and over, we have to identify just three data points and monitor them obsessively. There's no magic in the number three, but I will say this. Far too many schools, when I sit down with them to try to help them evaluate data, have no data. And then we try to identify things they're going to monitor in the future. And all of a sudden, we've got 17 things on the list that we want to know more about. And we have the ability to know more about. And typically, I come back a year later, and none of those 17 are being monitored. Identify three things and watch them. Figure them out and watch them. If you've done that effectively for six months, then you can add three more. Don't bite off more than you can chew. In relationship to recruitment, we have to start looking at our model. Is it truly a recruitment house, or is it an admissions staff? And I define those two um, as being dramatically different. Think of admissions as ticket taking. I don't know about your movie theaters, but we have a guy at the movie theater that I go to. You buy the ticket at the front counter, and then you literally walk through the building, and you hand it to the man who rips it in half. I don't, this is archaic. If you think about it, rips it in half and sends you into the movie. The guy who's taking the ticket is not recruiting. You've already bought it. It's done. We used to be able to be admissions staff in the world of adult student recruitment. We used to be able to say, build it, and they will come. And there were plenty of students. The pressure was not on. There was not much competition. Today, it's about recruitment. It's about aggressively going out, connecting and engaging with adult students who maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe five years from now are going to come back. But we need to stay attached to and continuously communicate with so that when they do make the choice to come back to school, they choose us. We have to take a look at outdated recruitment methods and how that process works. And that leads me nicely into a quick note. We do have a secret shopper webinar coming up on June 27th. I really want to invite you to go to our website and get registered for that. Um, June 27th, secret shopper webinar. It looks at recruitment practices. You are going to uh, laugh and cry. <laughs> it, it's quite an interesting um, webinar that was put together from a series of secret shopping that we did um, over the course of a couple of months at adult student programs. I want you to take a look at who your main competitors are, places you, 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 utilize, yeah, you do sometimes lose students to. Not every competitor in the world, just those you truly do lose students to. And I will tell you that most often, they're probably out recruiting you. That's a huge piece of it. We have to critically be willing to examine our own internal processes for recruitment. And I do mean critically examine. And not, well, Betty doesn't want to work Saturday, so we aren't ever open Saturday. But honestly evaluate if we were building it from scratch, how would we build it? We have to get honest about our people. People recruit students. It's not about marketing. It's not about gimmicks. It's the human element of recruitment that gets students in the door. We have to be willing to look at those. We have to identify our wow, and hopefully there's more than one wow, and make sure we're promoting those things in strong ways. We have to have clear, developed process, and we have to follow it in recruitment every single time. And no, Johnny down the hall, just because he's good and our top recruiter can't follow a different process that he likes. We have to have a process institutionally. And again, that point about data. Last thing, retention. We have to start looking at retention as a very cradle-to-grave approach. We have to start thinking about professional advising and helping these people from a mentality of coaching them throughout their experience. Hand-holding with adult students is the norm. If you don't like it, you should not be working with adult students. They need our assistance. They need our help. Just because you work in the world of higher ed every day doesn't mean they do. They, it's foreign country, and they need assistance. We have to be willing to re-recruit our own students at least a couple of times a year, make them glad that they are sticking with us. There are no dropouts in the world of higher ed. I really believe that there's only people who stop out for a period of time. We have to help them achieve their goal and understand what their intentions were right from the start of their engagement with us. We have to have clear process for re-engagement and, again, the data points. So the last four things I'm going to say quickly. First and foremost, when you're looking at creating success for your institution, Measurable marketing. What can you measure in relationship to marketing? Marketing isn't a perfect science, but there's a whole lot more science to it today than there ever was before. Established recruitment process, clear recruitment process. We have to have intentional points of data collection throughout and a willingness to have the hard conversations. And I will say today is a better day than any other to have some of those hard conversations. We are going to include for you the references from the webinar. 
and then also go to our um, resources section within the context of the website and you'll be able to take a look at what's available there. I want to thank you for your time. Please fill out the survey. On the survey, it says, do you ever want to follow up with Brenda or have any questions for Brenda? Please don't hesitate. I serve as a resource for a lot of institutions. I also travel a lot. So if you'd ever wouldn't mind if I stopped by and visited your campus, please make a note of that on the survey form. Thank you for attending with us today. Sorry we ran just a minute over. I hope that you found it to be interesting and helpful, and good luck in the work that you do moving forward. Thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Have a good day, everyone.